Hello, everyone. I am joined today by Bantamweight, Billy Markle. Billy, how are we doing today? We're doing fantastic. How are you doing today, brother? I'm doing great. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. So, you wanted to be a karate kid ever since you were young, but I wanted to ask, where did your love for martial arts come from? Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> um, Three Ninjas, Power Rangers. Pretty much ever since I was a kid, I was always obsessed with like martial arts and like the aspect of like a ninja, a ninja being a martial artist through and through. You know, I always liked like beating up the bad guy, like things like that. I liked some anime shows when I was a kid and everything like that. So like always had love for martial arts and it just grew more and more as I grew older. And then um, now it's kind of all I do, you know? Okay. Okay. So the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles started it, but would you say like something expanded on it at some point? Like were you watching fights um, from a young age or? Yeah, I didn't really watch fights from a young age. I watched a lot of like pro wrestling as a okay. kid. But um, do you ever see the movie Never Back Down? I haven't actually. <laughs> ne- What's it about? You? Oh no! You've never oh, no. seen Never. Oh, I messed you've up. never seen Never Back Down. I messed oh, up. Dude. I it's a. I always joke saying that it's one of the greatest movies of all time, but okay. it's like the original, like I guess MMA movie okay. from like the early two thousands, where it's like the high school ki- like the kid moves to florida and everyone trains mma and he gets beat up by the local kid who's like an mma star you know yeah and he needs and to he train starts, to you know, get like better a, than him yeah yeah he does a six-week mini camp learns a bunch of life lessons <laughs> and he beats up the bad guy in the head but um i saw never back down uh with my dad when i was probably like in fifth sixth grade somewhere around there and then i started watching the ultimate fighter after that and um the first season i watched was like the first season I watched live, you know, was um, Chuck Liddell versus Tito Ortiz. Good season. It was like at Court McGee in it. It was a great season. And then after that, I kind of got hooked. And I just started following like MMA very religiously, like okay. watching all the fights I could find online. Whereas, like, you know, I was a teenage kid. I couldn't really like order pay per views yeah, every no. weekend. You but I'm just, like, oh, you could YouTube, just find what you UFC. could. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then, nice. uh, yeah. All right, that, that, that's a really cool way to start the journey. I know a lot of people have, like, different mm-hmm. stories, but that's one of the cooler ones, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I mm-hmm. like that. So Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So you're coming off a win in May over a Med Commis. It was a unanimous decision. Just tell me a little bit about the fight and if it went the way you thought it was going to and what, what you thought about your opponent. Uh, I keep on thinking I have, like, a reoccurring theme in my fights where it's like it never really goes the way that I think <laughs> it's going to go. But, um... It was a good fight, tough fight. Um, I got cut early on during the fight, so it was like first round. It was like a lot of blood in my eye. It was hard to see, and then um, it was a, he had good striking. We had good grappling exchanges. I won all three rounds. Uh, definitely didn't go the way I thought, just because it was like I got cut over one eye and then my other eye shut over so it's like by round three, I'm like fighting with half an eye pretty like, much, which is like you're just like oh yeah, yeah. no, literally. <laughs> I remember like, like is that the referee or is, is that the referee or is that him? <laughs> During round three, I'm like, all right, I guess this is gonna be a fun one. <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> but um, he was a tough kid. He came forward. He was willing to fight. It was a good, uh, really good fight. And um, didn't go the way I thought it was gonna go. Obviously, like it's funny because I feel like with a lot of my fights is a recurring theme where I think that people are gonna want to grapple more, they end up okay. wanting to strike more. And then when they want to strike more, they when I think, think they want to strike more, they end up wanting to grapple yeah. more. So it's like a recurring theme with a lot of my camps where it's like ends up going the opposite. Or like if I think I'm going to strike more, I'm going to end up grappling more the opposite, you know. But um, that's the beauty about mixed martial arts. Yeah, where it's it like you never really know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes we might be striking more or keeping at distance. Sometimes we might be fighting a little bit more in the pocket. Sometimes grappling a little bit more. Yeah, no, that's yeah. that's the name of the game. I mean, that's why you kind of have to stay well-rounded at all times and make sure all your areas are well-oiled at constantly mm-hmm. because you can't go into a fight with just one specific mindset in mind because then, mm-hmm. like you said, shit can always hit the fan and go the other way, and then, then you're in a pretty shitty situation. Mm-hmm. It's one of the worst things you can see in fights where it's like um, a fighter that's more of a one-sided fighter mm-hmm. where it's like very much only a grappler or only a striker and it's like they are getting forced to stick with what's not not their normal expertise they get a little like you see them oh, a little no. bit I crumble mean, a little yeah, bit you more see, you see it yeah. very much in fights i mean dan hooker mm-hmm. and claudio poyez comes to mind where mm-hmm. once, dan oh, hooker, once dan hooker shut down the takedown it was like it was hard to watch the fight cron gracie and charles jordan also like fights like that come mm-hmm. to mind where when guys are so one-sided that they can't control certain areas that it's like it's almost mm-hmm. hard it's almost hard to watch because of how much of a mismatch it is even like um, think about a lot of Habib fights. Like when Habib yeah. fought like Edson Barboza, like comes to mind. Whereas like when 
like it's not a good grappling. Don't get me wrong. Just like, but Habib's grappling obviously. No, so yeah, and we saw him down and we saw and Bryce that. Mitchell dominate Edson Barboza on the ground. We know Bryce Mitchell's good, mm-hmm. but his grappling is nowhere near the level of Khabib. Mm-hmm. So it shows the mm-hmm. the difference he, in skill. Even Bryce Mitchell, it's always funny. It could always say something about Bryce uh, Mitchell and uh, Illyria Sephora yeah. when they fought. Didn't get the takedown. Sephora kept the standing, and you just see, yeah. like, did not go well for him. You know, no, not at all. So you've talked a lot about how Henan Burrell was a big inspiration because he lost his pers- first pro fight and then went on to have an amazing MMA career. Who are some other guys you took inspiration from when you were on your way up and still taking from inspiration from today? Um, as a lad, like a teenager, I was a huge TJ Dillashaw guy because, mm. again, like when I first started watching the Open Fighter, it was like original, like original Open Fighter season, <laughs> but it was like back in the day. So it's like I saw. Like I watched when TJ was on the Open Fighter Live. It was uh, Team Bisping versus Team Jason Mayhem Miller. And I became a big fan of his after that. He lost okay. the finals against Sean Dodson. And then obviously, you know, not really. I fell off as a fan for a period of, uh, for a period of time. You know, never, like, not liked him. But, you know, I wasn't a big fan that he was using, like, PEDs mm-hmm. and everything like that. But um, when I was a kid, definitely TJ Dillashaw. Always been a huge George St. Pierre uh, fan. Uh, Frankie Edgar. I feel like every you can't be a fighter from New Jersey and not and name I love Frankie Edgar. You know, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, he's like one like one of the greatest of all time. And then uh, I Habib obviously. And then like even like back in the day, he used to be a huge Junior Dos Santos guy back Ooh, when okay. I was like, a, I like that back pick. in the day. Cain Velasquez, you know, mm. DC Daniel Cormier, and um, and obviously I think Uriah Faber was like when I was a kid, like Team Alpha Male. That's also like circling back to mm. the show. When I was a lad, and like even to this day, I still have a lot of love for Team Alpha Man. But like when I was a kid, they were like, especially because they were smaller guys. Yes, exactly. Like back when, back when like I was really first getting into MMA heavily, it was like like Chad Mendez, Joe Benavidez, Rod Faber, TJ Dolce was on up, and they were all top dogs in, in their divisions. Yep. And then Jose Aldo is one of the greatest fighters of all time, you know. But um, a lot of fighters, I I watch a lot of fights. I'm very much dedicated to just like I like even if I wasn't a fighter, for instance, mm-hmm. I'd. I love the game. I love the sport. I like follow it religiously. I it's literally all I pretty much do. You know, I yeah. watch it all the time. I'm, I can't get bored of it. It's the only thing that I literally can't get bored of. You know? Yeah. No, I definitely trust me. I get it. So it seems like you really, uh, you really just love the sport so much, and you just pulled inspiration from from everyone. Like that's probably the mm-hmm. the most um, inspirations I've got when I've asked a question, and I love yeah. it because you really like went into depth about like a lot of the guys who you watch coming up. I really, I really like that mm-hmm. answer. And I, mm-hmm. I like the Junior Dos Santos picks, the Cain Velasquez picks. Like those guys well, were bad asses that no one even talks about. Man, it's so bad. Mm-hmm. it's so sad. One of the first fights I watched, like, because my family wouldn't buy pay per views for like UFC events back in the day, but Junior Dos Santos versus Cain Velasquez. It was like one of the first UFC on Fox events when uh, they fought the first time. Oh. And JDS, I was a big Cain guy beforehand because you know Cain beat Brock. Lesnar and like I was a big WWE kid as a kid so I'm like bro if this guy beat Brock Lesnar this guy must be a world beater you know and then JDS comes in jab jab right uppercut knocks out Kane in the first one game over and then I became a big JDS guy for Mm -hmm. a hot period of time but I've never been a huge heavyweight guy like heavyweight low uh heavyweight middleweight have always been like my two weight classes like I love I like I don't discriminate against any weight class, like I'd be wrong, but like I've always followed more like fifty five and below. Yeah, I mean you know? as a smaller guy, yeah. the smaller weight classes just have more interest for you. It makes sense. Yeah, it for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you you coach at Strategic MMA, you train at Nick Catones, mm-hmm. you've also spent time at the Institute Muay Thai. You got a couple different places you're at, but what would you consider your home gym? I wouldn't consider any gym really my home. <laughs> I cross train everywhere where it's okay. like some days I'll be training at Strategic in the morning and then be training at Nick's at night or, like, the opposite. Where, like, for instance, like, Monday morning I do Jiu-Jitsu at Strategic Combat Academy. But then Monday night I do, like, a team practice at Nick's. Okay. Um, I work with Frank Wells heavily at the Institute. Frank Wells, I have a lot of love for uh, Coach Burke at the Institute. Mm-hmm. He's helped me a lot in my career. Yeah, Coach but, Burke's um, a great guy. I tra- great guy. Mm-hmm. And I've been at Strategic Combat Academy since I was 13 years old. I work there. It's And I also teach at Nick's. And it's – uh. They're like a family to me, and I do a lot of my training there, and I also do a lot of my training at Nick's. Like Coach Nick is a, I work with him. Uh, Coach Shorty, I work with Frankie, and then all my teammates there, like Mark Gray, you know, uh, Nick Crelly, a lot of great guys there. So I wouldn't say I really have like a home home gym, but it's more like a community, you know. Okay. And it's um, we live in like a community state, and I feel like that's like one of the benefits where it's like, 
it's really hard to be an MMA fighter and train strictly at one gym. Like you always have to outsource something, you know? So it's like, I got a little bit of everything everywhere, you know? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I love the idea of like the cross training. It's just, it's just funny because usually fighters do have like a home location, but you don't even consider yourself having one. And I actually, I feel like that's more modern. I feel like it's more modern to have mm -hmm. like multiple gyms and like cross train in multiple places and not really have a home because you really do need to have like so many training partners from so many you need you need a lot of different looks there's so many different For fighters sure. there's so many different styles you just need as many looks as you can get from the highest level guys so i really do like that you you like to break your time up between different places i think it's smart i did like coach nick's definitely like my head coach mm -hmm. but um it's just one of those things where it's like also like does nick schedule wise you like, when you fight yeah okay mm -hmm. yeah yeah um it's one of those things where it's like schedule wise it's hard to like train at one place everywhere especially if you like I teach classes, I do PTs. It's like what I do to make money, you know, got to pay the bills. And um, so it's like, I got to go a little bit everywhere. And then also it's like, always trying to get the best training that works for your schedule. So it's like, if I can't make it one place at a certain time, I might have to go somewhere else at a certain time. And to make sure I get like everything I need to do, where it's like some mornings, I'm down at Nick's, some nights I'm at Shujik, some mornings I'm at my dance too. And uh, yeah, I'm a little bit everywhere, you know? Yeah. No, definitely. Who would you say are some of the guys you, you talked about a couple of them, but who would you say are some of the guys that your like main training partners are? Um, Ryan Risco has been like my big brother since I was a kid. You okay. know, he's like my ride or die. He's like, like he's not my head coach, but he's like my life coach pretty much. And like, uh, he helps me a lot. He's a pro fighter. That's cool. Um, but Mark Ray is one of my main training partners during and through. Nick Corelli is one of my main training partners. Frank Wells, it's like, I love that. I love Frank Wells' depth. I'm like one of the biggest I, Frank I've Wells I've heard guys. so many good things about Frank. I gotta, gotta talk with him. Oh, he's a great guy. Um, and then, like, a lot of guys at Shreja Combat Academy, like, um, even, like, there's a bunch of people there that, like, aren't even fighters that, like, I train with day in, day out, and I consider them, uh, like, family, like, there's uh, one guy, George Morgan, uh, Jeff, uh, and then there's other fighters like Ishmael. Ishmael is fighting for a belt in New York tomorrow. Nice. Who, he's an MMA fighter, kickboxer from Shijik. Um, There's this kid, Gavin. There's a lot of kids. Gavin on McQuaid. Up. I watched Gavin McQuaid. Gavin Mc I watched Gavin McQuaid's last knockout. Gavin, <laughs> Gavin McQuaid. And then um, a bunch of the guys at Knicks. And then, yeah. And then just, you know training everywhere and uh i get a good look a lot of different looks too where it's like sometimes i get a little bit more of a like wrestler looks grappler looks a little bit of everything you know yeah no definitely it makes a lot of sense to me so what would you say is the most fulfilling part of being a coach because you're you're a coach as much as you are a fighter so oh 100 percent um i wholeheartedly i love what i do i love teaching i like helping them i like seeing people that I work with improve and understand and get like uh, understanding concepts and like working on everything it's just improving it makes me happy it really does make me happy so that's probably overall the best thing and then also when like I corner some of the guys too when it's like up in fights and everything and seeing them like fighting's a very much highs highs lows lows type of sport and then being with them when the highs of highs is just something that like overall it gets me happy like i yeah. like seeing my people do well you know of course i'm like uh i'm one of those people that's like i like if you're doing well it makes me happy and it makes all of us do well and then also it does suck sometimes it's like highest highs lowest lows where it's like i have to be there when they're at their lowest lows yeah, too and i want them to be there for me when i'm at my lowest lows but uh definitely seeing the like some of the younger guys i work with and some other guys work with do well in fights and also just improve overall it makes me happy okay Okay, that's a really uh, that's a really coach answer. <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> that's beautiful. I love it. So, on top of being you know an MMA coach and a fighter, you're also a certified personal trainer. You're a nutrition coach and you're a weight cutting coach. How did you get involved in that side of MMA? Um, I've always I've always like uh, seen people cut weight. And I've always been around cutting weight, and it's like I hate cutting weight. <laughs> I will be the first person to say I I hate it. I've always just wanted to get better at it and then uh, just gain knowledge about it in any way possible. And then um, before COVID, I got, like, a Mike Dolce cert, uh, just because it was, like, Mike Dolce is from New Jersey, hosts certifications in New Jersey. And then when COVID hit, I was very interested in getting, like, the Lockhart Leaf, like, George Lockhart's, like, uh, weight cut cert. Okay. And then COVID hit, I had a bunch of free time, and I was like, screw it, might as well do it, you know? Like, I don't have anything else to do, you know? And uh, that's where I got a little bit more into it. Okay. Okay. That no, definitely makes sense. So I've seen a lot of the support from a lot of the local guys on your Instagram page and stuff. Paul Capaldo, 
uh, Frankie mm-hmm. Edgar, even like Chris mm-hmm. Musa. There's a, there's a couple guys I've seen that like give yeah. you a lot of support. How does it feel knowing that you have a lot of support from the local guys that are like coming up and the local guys that are like legends like Frankie Edgar? Just like it's like every it feels like everyone in the area has your back. So I just just wanted to know. I mean, it's definitely nice, and I definitely appreciate all the support. And I think it's like one of those things where we all support each other. Like Paulie C, like Paulie C is one of my guys, mm-hmm. and I'm excited whenever he fights. Like he fought in the last CFMC card in New yeah. Jersey, went out there had a dominant performance, and it's just one of those things where it's like we all support one another. Another like um, you're really like this is an individual sport, but mm-hmm. you're not gonna get anywhere without a team and supporting one another. Where it's like you need teammates, you need a support a support system. Um, the Frankie thing is definitely like one of those things where it's like very surreal for me mm-hmm. at points because like he was literally like my hero as a kid yeah so it's like every so often he'll say something to me i'm like god dude like i'm talking to frankie like very like weird even though like i've trained with him at this point for a few years <laughs> I, but I, like, I was about to say i've seen you in pictures within the ring with frankie talking about oh yeah. he said something to me you've trained with him man you've got i know as good but as even get. even like sometimes like he'll say something to me i'm like bro Frankie just said that, and it's a little bit of, like, a surreal feeling. Like, I always think about, like, what would, like, 16-year-old Bill, be, like, <laughs> think, think about this, yeah. you know? Yeah. But um, it's all about supporting one another. Like, like Chris Muse, like, he's one of my guys. I work with him a lot, and he's one of my main training partners, too. Like, he busted up his hand his last fight, but, like, we all support one another. Like, mm-hmm. he'll help me. I'll help him. Paul is sees the same, where it's like, he'll help me. I help him. We all help one another. We all just, like, I want to see all of us get to the top. I want to get to the top, and I think that's the best way we can do it, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. And it's absolutely awesome to see because I, I swear, I've been to two regional events, and I swear everyone's connected. I, I, everyone is connected. Oh, 100%. I, I, I've, I, it's, it's crazy. It's actually crazy. I didn't realize how, like, close of everyone was. I hear, I hear guys from, like... I don't know. I'll hear guys from like di- like far gyms talking about like Frank Wells and like Nazar Dimes, mm-hmm. and I'm like, wait, you guys like it's it just mm-hmm. it's just weird to me. I don't understand how all of it's connected. How it is? The fight community is a huge community, but a really small community at the same time. Like yeah. we all have each other's back. Like obviously we don't have each other's back when it's time to like, throw down no. everything. <laughs> but it's like uh, it's like also like the martial artist thing, where it's like the first thing in martial arts is like respect. Mm-hmm. So it's like we all respect one another through and through. And then it's like a big but small community. Like everyone's cross trained. Everyone's trained a little bit. People have moved and trained elsewhere, you yeah. know. And it's like word of mouth. And then also just events where it's like I've like made casual friends at like events with people from like different states where it's like. We follow each other on social media we really don't know each other but you know we but, fought on the same card one yeah. time and then we were talking in the back and we became cool you know yeah and you just support each other here and there and just mm-hmm. yeah no i definitely understand where you're coming from so you had a fight in cffc that didn't go your way i want to say it was last year late last year it was december yep. yes late last year so what was the biggest lesson you learned from that loss uh, i mean it's just like i didn't fight to my full potential i wholeheartedly believe that i did not do what I should have done. I didn't follow the game plan. There was a lot of things that I just should have done better. And like to this day, like I don't, I'm very hard on myself in general. And to this day, I'll probably always be hard on myself about that fight where it's like um, between like boxing and MMA, I've only lost two fights ever. And um, it's still like, even my, like I lost my first, like how we were talking about Hannibal Brown. Mm-hmm. Like I lost my first AMI MMA fight. Yeah. And to this day, it will probably bother me to the day I die. Like to the day I die. And then obviously that fight as a professional now, it bothers me even more. Yeah. Like it's gonna bother me even more, and I just don't think I performed to my full potential that night. I didn't follow the game plan, and I wasn't as composed as I should have been. And those are like the big things that I've been trying to work on. And um, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I, I mean, it happens in the fight game. You know, you get you get caught and mm-hmm. you lose. But I just, I, I just was wondering if, like, you know, if it was still lingering on your mind at all, like how you felt about it and stuff. And like, mm-hmm. I can tell you're, I can tell obviously now you're the kind of guy that, you know, you can't get past those losses. They're always on your mind. I will, yeah. All respect to him and everything, but um, and even my first, like, even my fought, first Amy loss ever, like, I'm mean and the guy that fought, uh, fought my first Amy uh, MMA fight. Mm-hmm. We talk on social media here and there. Oh, and we're really yeah. cool. But to this day, <laughs> to this day, that off. fight will always, yeah always bother me and it's just one of those things where it's like i'm a competitor and i'm in this to be the best and um i will always be hard on myself i'm hard on myself on my wins like even like when i win i could have a dominant performance and i'm still gonna be a little bit hard on myself about it where i'm like i should have done this and like even like my last fight where I mean, yeah like, you were just I hard rem- on yourself for your last fight that you 30 I, w- I was <laughs> yeah i got swept in like a tie sweep i got right on up but it was like literally in 
that moment, I was like, you. I was like, <laughs> I was mad at, not, not mad at him. I'm mad <laughs> that he hit me with it, but I was mad that I fell for it. Yeah. I was like, wow, I can't believe I just got tie swapped like that. <laughs> I got right on up, don't get me wrong, but I was still like, in that moment, very upset with myself. More upset with myself than I am with him. Like, I'm always very hard on myself. But even like little things like that will always, bother. every single fight, there's always like certain details that I remember vividly. And just being a little bit disappointed in myself, yeah, no, and then obviously, too, mm-hmm. but then obviously that fight, like my first fight, you know, always bothered me a little bit more, you know. Yeah, no, definitely. But you need, like, like I said, you need to take those things away from every fight because if you're just, you know, you can't be complacent ever. You always have to mm-hmm. be working on things. You always have to be finding problems in your game and always constantly evolving. So it's good that even in, you know, thirty twenty seven unanimous decision wins that you're sitting there upset with your game because you fell for a sweep and you you know didn't lost an exchange or two you know what i mean it's like mm-hmm. i, I like i like that idea it really shows like you know like just the way your mind works and like how dedicated you are to the sport i like it mm-hmm. so i wanted to get your opinions on this what were your thoughts on jamal hill vacating the ufc light heavyweight championship due to a ruptured achilles injury i was thinking about this earlier I might. I think I want to like look into it because mm-hmm. this is where like I'm an MMA nerd. I get stuck into this. I think light heavyweight might have the history for most vacant like vacancies ever. Because like yeah, think about it. Three, John Jones least. vacated the belt. John Jones vacated the belt once, maybe twice. Mm-hmm. Yuri just vacated it, and now Jamal Hill's vacating it. Yeah. Like, and I feel like there's. I feel like there has to be another one too. There but I don't know. I, I I'm not super familiar with like Achilles injuries like that, but. Whatever I they do interim like this is where also UFC kind of irks me at points where I'm like for instance like Yair versus Josh Emmett didn't need to be an interim title fight it really didn't Josh uh, freaking Volk was fighting Islam and then he literally just turned around and fought Yair right after it's not like yep. he was gonna be out for a while yeah you they know? just wanted to add a little spice like, to that fight That's yeah and then I'm like but I'm like so they can't do like an interim title for like heavyweight even like we're going back to Hennon Burrell mm-hmm. keep on circling back Hennon Burrell defended the interim belt against Michael Michael made a, uh, McDonald Uriah Fa- oh he became a cha- uh, he won against Uriah Faber mm-hmm. he defended against Eddie Wyland yeah and then he, had, he, he had two became, defenses yeah as interim and then he mm-hmm. like won won the belt when he was supposed to fight Dominic Cruz at the potential center and, and Dom uh, was Dominic still Cruz. injured yep he yeah. pulled out and then they made it him versus Faber again but so it's like he had a few interim title defenses while Dominic Cruz was injured. So I'm like, how long? I would have to like look a little bit more. Like, how long is Jamal Hill most likely going to be out with everything? But even like uh, Jerry, like I was like, what he rep? Like they're talking about is Jerry fighting like at the end of the summer, end of the year? Like what's going on here? I so I'm know. like, it's because I saw something online that people were saying like they should have Jerry fight. Oh wait, did I just? Oh sorry, no, I thought good. I like. I thought I hung up for a second. Oh, don't um, worry, you're happy. They were talking. <laughs> Uh, they were talking about Jerry coming back and fighting for the belt, this and that. So I would have to look into how long is Jamal Hill most likely to be out, but why not an interim? Like, I'm not a big fan of interim belts, but, like, if a champ's actually injured, injured and there's a do an interim belt. It. Yeah, why not? Yeah, like, when it was Volk, like, when Volk was fighting Islam, and Volk was very, like, even beforehand, he was like, I'm going to beat Islam, even though he lost the fight, even yeah. though really close fight could have gone either or. Yeah. But he was like, I'm going to beat Islam, and then he's like, I'm going to defend the featherweight belt within a few months. Like, it wasn't like he was like, oh, I'm going to beat Islam, and I'm probably going to sit, take six months yeah. off, you know, relax for a little bit. He was like, no, I want to be active. So, I don't know. I'm not a fan of it, to be completely honest. And then it's like, what are they going to do? Are they going to have a header versus uh Versus Jan for the light heavyweight belt I mean, that's now, gotta or be, gonna... that's got to be the easy solution. There's no way they complicate mm-hmm. it more than that. Like in my mind, I would for... say you make you make another fight, or you make the winner of uh, Pereira Jan versus like Yuri or something like that. But mm-hmm. the, the problem is, why complicate it? What happened the last time they did a vacant title fight? It was Magomed and Yan. They went to a draw. That's... It screwed everything mm-hmm. over. They already had this fight booked and ready. They might as well just throw a title on it and. That, that's I think it's the easiest thing. I saw a thing online that they were saying they should do Matamed versus uh, Yuri I for the light too. heavyweight belt. But I was like, is Yuri ready to fight again? He did the whole, when Jamal won the belt, he's like, I'm coming. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, is he like, how's his recovery going? Is he coming back? But I think if the champ's injured, it's not going to be like an injury. going to be out for like a year and a half, mm-hmm. two years. Just do an intro belt. Like, they literally did an intro belt for no reason for freaking uh, Yair and Josh Emmett. So, it's like, why can't you actually do an intro belt for no, an actual I reason for an actual champ like that, you know? I, from what I saw, I think the ruptured Achilles is supposed to take around four to six months. But 
then, Bro, but then, but then there's rehab and stuff. So mm-hmm. I, 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 what I said is we were we're not going to see him until at least March, April of next year. But still, that's not like, yeah. like I don't. You know. could easily do some champs defend the belt, like defend the belt like twice a year. Yeah. Like you could literally have an Once interim year, title even. fight. Yeah, you could literally have an interim title fight at the end of the year, November, December, and then have Jamal Hill come back and fight whoever's the interim yeah. champ, March. March, May, April, you know, that would be like a perfect timeline. Like it wouldn't, no one would literally be turning heads or anything. Cause Jamal Hill didn't even have a fight book at this point. You know, it's not like he was supposed to fight next week or like in a few months, you know, like have an interim title fight towards the end of the year. And then whenever Jamal Hill's ready, like towards the beginning, you know, spring, summer of next year, have him to fight the interim, uh, fight the interim champ. Yeah. I like that idea. I mean, I, I just don't understand why it's back to back now. I mean, the fact that it was back to back champions that vacated after an injury kind of shows that the UFC might have had a little bit of influence on the champions giving up their belts. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I feel like I feel like there might have been an agreement on the side or something that the UFC came to with Yuri or and Jamal mm-hmm. not to hold up the division. Like I don't know. So I saw someone say that they they have been struggling for pay per views because you see them making headliners like. Tony Ferguson and Nate Diaz. You know what I mean? Like, why is mm-hmm. that headlining a pay per view? So they mm-hmm. they have been having troubles trouble finding championship fights to headline pay per views. So there's a real chance that maybe they got really scared that they weren't going to have that light heavyweight title fight to headline a pay per view. So they just they just tried to come to an agreement with Jamal the same way they did with Yuri. Possibly, I don't know for sure. It just feels weird but that both it... both guys gave up the belt that they worked their entire career to get just because of an injury that was going to last around a year you know what i mean like mm-hmm. it's not like it's unheard of we've seen it before yeah all the time even gsp gsp yeah. he towards acl he was out for longer than a year you know it's like a six to nine month like post-op before you start doing everything else you know and then he carlos condit was the interim champ never defended the intra belt and then it, gsp versus condit like there's yeah. been so many times and it's definitely weird that's back to back at light heavyweight mm-hmm. and i feel like light heavyweight just like kind of not in a bad way isn't the same ever since like john jones oh, it's a DC, cursed division. like you know it's a cursed yeah. division 100 percent. It, it's just like it's not the same it also yeah. like in my head like it's like not the real champ because i'm like mm-hmm. jb like john jones like if he decided to go back down to 205 which i don't think he would yeah. by any means and but he, if he did he could but yeah. yeah if he did He's going to be the champ, in my opinion. I think he takes down Yuri. Very I think he would take down Jamal Hill. I think he, I think he's going to do that. But, um, yeah, and it's, like, just so many vacancies at a light heavyweight. And then it just doesn't make sense why they don't have an interim title to fight, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. All right, to get back to you, though. So when can we expect to see another Billy Markle master class? I'm hoping to fight. I'm waiting on everything like my coaches do. Like I very much like to listen to my coaches and like just follow the follow the game plan, you know. Yeah. But I'm hoping to fight in September at some point or okay. another, you know. September, October, but hopefully September. I would like to fight. Ideally, I'd want to fight like September, October, and I want to get one more fight by the end of the year, you know. Okay. Okay. So, what are your goals in the sport of MMA? Just overall. I want to be the best you know i want to be the best you know i'm not in this just to be me and just be like a regional fighter i want to make it to the ufc i want to make it a bellator i want to make it to one fc i want to make it to a major promotion i want to fight for the belt i want to fight for belts i'm in this for the long run and and i just want to see how far i could take this thing you know like i want to go as far as humanly possible i want to go ufc bellator one fc and just keep going I love it, Billy. I love it. All right, I, everyone, I thank you for watching. This was my interview with Billy Markle. Billy, I'll see you soon. Be good, my brother. I'll see you soon. Thank you, brother. I appreciate, I appreciate you for having me.